I'm delighted to introduce our next uh, speaker, yeah. Rosamond McKittrick. Um, she is Professor Emirita of Medieval History and former Director of Research here in Cambridge at the Faculty of History, a Fellow of Sydney Sussex College and Keeper of its Manuscripts and Archives. Um, Rosamond McKittrick is one of the greatest historians of Europe in the early Middle Ages. Um, a vast body of work as well, 13 books, edited volumes, uh, and a huge amount of chapters and articles. <coughs> and in this, he has focused particularly on the Frankish kingdoms in the 8th and 9th centuries, early medieval Rome, and the history of the book. Um, she has also served as the chair of the Faculty of Archaeology, History, and Letters of the British School in Rome since 2013, and until last year was general editor of Cambridge Studies of Medieval Life and Thought. Um, in 2010, she was honoured with the Dr. A. H. Heineken International Prize for History. Her current work in progress, um, not without deep connections to the subject of today's conference, is a book titled The Migration of Ideas in the Early Middle Ages. And Professor Rosemont McKittrick's paper for today is titled From Viennese Lawyer to Cambridge Historian, The Early Career of Walter Ullmann, 1938-1946. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rosemont McKittrick. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you too to Aaron and Theo for inviting me to speak. The work I've done for this has taken me very strangely into parts of my own childhood because my early childhood was in Cambridge and some of the names I was reading about in the archive were people I remembered my father talking about and actually that I met. And then I was one of Walter Ullman's research students in the early 70s. Walter Ullman, a member of the history faculty at the University of Cambridge from 1949, as lecturer, reader, and ultimately professor of medieval history until his death in 1983, is known through his books and articles for a particularly distinctive contribution to scholarship on the European Middle Ages from the perspective of canon law and political thought. Before he fled to Cambridge from Austria in 1938, he was a practicing criminal lawyer, carrying out the preliminary investigations in the Untersuchungsabteilung for prosecution in the district court near Vienna. There appears to be a general understanding that many Central European scholars and scientists who escaped to Britain or America were either shaped intellectually by the experience of emigration or that the particular background of a number of Central European scholars enabled them to make a significant contribution to historiography in post-war Britain. The molecular biologist Max Perutz went so far as to say that had he stayed in his native Austria, he could never have solved the problem of protein structure. He would not have found the outstanding teachers and his colleagues or learned scientific rigour. He would have lacked the stimulus, the role models, the tradition of attacking important problems, however difficult, that Cambridge provided. Certainly, Ullmann himself commented, though with a different emphasis, that there was, I quote, nothing more conducive to creative thinking than exile. This morning, therefore, I want to explore the extent to which the transformation from professional lawyer to academic historian was the consequence of Ullmann's exile to England. Studies of particular groups of scholars, such as lawyers and historians, have often differentiated between those who arrived in Britain as children or adolescents and those who were already established scholars. Ullmann was somewhere in between these two broad categories for he arrived in England as a young man whose scholarly reputation was not only not yet established, but who had perforce left most of his early training behind. I shall focus on two elements of Ullman's early career. First of all, I shall outline his initial training as a lawyer 
and the circumstances of his arrival in Cambridge in 1938. I shall then examine the evidence for the process of transformation from criminal lawyer in Vienna to Cambridge medievalist, yielded by Ullmann's earliest publications between 1939 and 1946. <coughs> A word on the sources. Of his life before he came to Cambridge, Ullman himself said only a little, and that was in three autobiographical summaries written towards the end of his life. The first was on the occasion of his retirement dinner as Professor of Medieval History in 1978, when he stated that he was going to try to show what I was before I became what I am. The text of this after dinner speech, very, how do I move it on? Is it just, sorry, press this, that one. Okay, so there should be one in between, never mind. Um, that's it. Um, the text of this after dinner speech, very obviously designed for a Cambridge audience, was subsequently supplemented by a memoir written by his wife Elizabeth, that was circulated in 1989. Mrs. Ullman drew on two other autobiographical texts. One, the Autobiographische Darstellung, was composed in German for delivery to the Österreichische Akademie der Wissenschaften when Ullman was inducted as Korrespondierendes Mitglied in 1977. This contained more about the Austrian background, and a shortened version of it was published in English by the German Historical Institute in 1998. The other was a sketch, also in German, and written in the third person, that Walter had apparently begun to compile towards the end of his life, and from which Elizabeth Ullmann later quoted substantial extracts in her memoir. These meagre biographical details subsequently became standard elements of both the obituaries in 1983 and later appraisals of Ullmann's scholarship and teaching, with supplementary anecdotes and tributes supplied by Ullman's pupils from Ratcliffe College, from Leeds, and from Cambridge. Greater attention was therefore paid to Ullman's initial career in England as a school teacher, his two years as lecturer in Leeds, and his long ten tenure in Cambridge thereafter. There is also a wealth of critical appraisal of his work, from his article in the Juridical Review of 1940, discussing the medieval lawyer Bartolus on customary law, to his last book, written in German, on Pope Gelasius I. There were certainly many stories about Ullmann in circulation during his lifetime, but when I was a res his research student in the early 1970s, these were primarily about his character and behaviour, such as his fondness for reading the 13th century canon law Gratian's Decretum in bed and driving his car terrifyingly fast. <coughs> or, how he mistreated his equipe of doctoral students, rather than about his background. Apart from Walter's own recollections at the end of his life, therefore, I have resorted to both the information yielded from the minute books of the case subcommittee of the Cambridge Refugees Committee and the wonderfully well-organised archive of the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning, greatly helped by an excellent summary published by David Ibbotson about ten years ago. I shall supplement these details with my own exegesis of his earliest works and reflection on their implications in order to try and put Ullman in some kind of intellectual and historiographical context. So, Ullman in Austria. Yeah. Unlike many of the refugees who managed to find a haven in England from 1933 onwards, Ullman was not a Jew but a devout Catholic though in 1938 it emerged, to Ullman's own surprise, that his grandfather on his father's side had some Jewish ancestry. On the standard form for the SPSL, I think it's gone back a bit, yeah. Okay. Ullman stated that he'd been dismissed from his post in Vienna as a nicht arisch abstammung Mischling. But in his memoir, he states that his prosecution in the Viennese district court of many defendants who were SS men had earned him the implacable hatred of the Nazis, that's his phrase, and that he had refused to take the oath to the Führer after the Anschluss. Further, no man of military age who was not Jewish according to the Nuremberg laws was allowed to leave the country without military permission. 
but it was from the army that Waldman obtained a permit for four weeks' study leave. In his valedictory speech, he noted that the Jewish organizations could not and did not help me, as I was not one of them. My fate was that of a hybrid. The valedictory speech yields the basic information that Ullman came from some farming stock on his mother's side and the Sudetenland in Bohemia on his father's, and that his father was a GP. <clears throat> the family lived in the town of Pulka, northeast of Vienna, and very close to the Czech border. That all to pieces from his local church, and he was a very devout Catholic. That's what he would have seen each Sunday. As an infant in 1914, Walter accompanied both parents who went to serve in the medical corps on the Serbian front before the situation was judged unsuitable for a young child and he was sent back to his village. His earliest memories were of the miseries and brutalities of the Great War, as well as the terrible hardships and relative poverty his family experienced in its aftermath. He was educated in a local grammar school in the classics, but chose to read law firstly at the University of Vienna for two years, and then at the University of Innsbruck. It was there, by his own account, that Ullmann first became interested in crime as a social phenomenon. His course of study at both Vienna and Innsbruck is significant in relation to the shape of his subsequent career, so it's worth describing in a little more detail. This is documented in the certificates from Vienna and Innsbruck, the Rigorosa, which led to his graduating as Doctor of Law. He left school in 1929 and began to study law at the University of Vienna. He remained there for two years, that is, four semesters, 1929 to 30, in a system that largely comprised lectures with very little personal contact between professors and students. During the first three semesters, Orman studied Roman law, German law, canon law, and the history of law. His teacher for Roman law was Friedrich Wyss, and for the history of law, no less a scholar than the renowned medieval European economic and social historian Alphonse Dopsch, who was also a leading figure in the Monumenta Germania Historicus group for the editing of medieval charters. Ullmann, alas, was less impressed with Dopsch because, I quote, it seemed to him he lacked a classical background. In the fourth semester, Ullmann turned to private law and criminal procedure, but then, finding Vienna uncongenial, he moved to the University of Innsbruck. There, his training was in more specific aspects of the law. He studied criminal law, private law, civil legal procedure, but then, um, uh, sorry, political science, employment law, commercial law, economics and finance, and international law. He also enjoyed closer relations with his professors, notably Theodor Rittler and the law faculty's librarian, Dr. Hans Werder. After graduation, Ullmann worked in district courts in Innsbruck before he gained his post in the Vorbereitungsabteilung of the district court near Vienna and returned to Vienna to live in 1935. His lodgings were at Langasse 64, a quiet street just behind the Rathaus beyond the Ring. The court dealt with a range of social and political crimes, many of them increasingly perpetrated by SS men and Nazi supporters. After his court work each day, as a result of Rittler's recommendation, Ullmann gave lectures in criminal law as assistant to Ferdinand Kadetska, the professor of criminal law in the University of Vienna. Kadetska had played a prominent role in the efforts to reform Austrian law in the aftermath of the Great War. In Innsbruck, Rittler had already suggested that Ullmann concentrate on legal theory should he wish to continue his academic study of the law. Kadetska encouraged Ullmann further. Ullmann had begun with an interest in the concept of guilt but ordered his focus to concentrate on the origins of legal discussions of crime and criminal intent, which, as a result of his reading in the Österreichische Nationalbibliothek, hence the picture, he thought he would find in the teaching of the Glossators and Post-Glossators, that is, the Italian jurists of the 12th to 15th centuries, and their commentaries on Roman law. In the brief opportunities available when not engaged in court duties, most of each day, or in teaching, therefore, he started to prepare a Habilitationsschrift. 
The sequence of events for Ullmann after the Anschluss have to be reconstructed from both the later recollections and the documents in the archives I have already mentioned. He had been dismissed from his job on the 18th of May. The SPSL records a phone call from Mrs. Ellinger of Bath on the 19th of May telling them of Ullmann's existence, saying he was a student of the history of criminal law. And Mrs. Ellinger was a friend of Dr. Hans Werder, who Ullmann had known in Innsbruck. A letter dated the 24th of May from David Dalber, then a research fellow in Roman law in Gotham Keys, but later renowned biblical and Roman law scholar, was addressed to Mrs. Jane Rake of the Cambridge Refugees Committee, explaining Ullman's interest in the doctrines concerning criminal law of the medieval jurists, especially the post prosaitas that he had seen the text of two lectures Ullman had given in Vienna, and adding that he was a most promising scholar and, I quote, an extremely nice person, intelligent, modest, and reliable. Doe asked whether the Cambridge Refugees Committee could enable Ullman to spend two years doing research in Cambridge towards a PhD. My idea is that you might be kind enough to contribute one half of the expenses, i.e. about £90 a year, while the London Committee may pay the other half. This young man is suffering, only because he happens to be non-Aryan by race. I hope it will be possible to save him. Jane Wraith wrote to Walter Adams of the SPSL, saying that she was breaking it gently to David Dalber that the Cambridge Refugees Committee only had nine pounds, two shillings and twopence in the bank, <laughs> but wondering whether they might at least get Ullman remission of fees. The response from the SPSL was that they had heard already about Ullman from Mrs Ellinger. Mrs Ellinger wrote then a long letter in June, enclosing all the SPSL paperwork completed by Ullman. The redoubtable SPSL secretary, Esther Simpson, responded on the 8th of June to say that it is not easy to do anything for Dr. Ullman as his subject is perhaps the most difficult of all to deal with, even worse than philosophy, and he is too young to have made a reputation for himself. Mrs. Ellinger subsequently sent copies of the testimonials written in Austria on the 3rd and 10th of June, on the 18th of June, and on the 5th of August wrote again to SPSL to say that she had heard from Ullman that he was being helped to come to England as soon as he could obtain the necessary permit and visa. Further clues as to the chronological sequence are provided by the certified copies of Ullman's examinations, for these are dated the 31st of May, 1938. The Cambridge Research, the Cambridge Refugees Committee was the people who helped Ullman primarily. And I hope we shall hear more about this remarkable committee tomorrow. Interestingly, Oxford had no counterpart. The Cambridge Refugees Committee comprised the main committee and a number of subcommittees, the Case Committee, the Information <coughs> Committee, the Hun Stanton Domestic Retraining Scheme and the Children's Scheme. The minute books of the Case Committee and some more general correspondence were donated to the UL in 1972 together with a register of those whose status had to be determined by local tribunals after the 17th of May, 1940. This archive indicates that moves to establish organised assistance for refugees began in Cambridge in late March, 1938, that it was determinately inclusive of all refugees, and that it was from the beginning in touch with all the major committees in London, especially the SPSL. Most of the letters setting up the committees and inviting people to join, that you see now on this list, were written by Mrs. Jane Wraith, and it was she who got the Cambridge Committee formally affiliated to the SPSL, in her words, so as not to duplicate effort. <coughs> the Cambridge Committee's membership, as you see, was broadly representative of Cambridge academics, wives of Cambridge academics, Cambridge businessmen or their <coughs> wives, members of various Christian churches, Catholic and Protestant, the Friends and the Jewish Community and the Trades Union Council. According to the Minute Book for the 19th of September 1939, at a meeting on the 23rd of August, £50 had been earmarked for Dr. Ullman, and on the 19th of September, hospitality for Dr. Ullman was discussed. The Reverend Haywood was to be approached. On the 12th of October, it was reported that the Reverend Haywood had given Dr. Ullman hospitality for 10 days, Legend has it that they didn't get on. 
and he was now to go to Ridley Hall, courtesy of Charlie Morrill, at a cost of 10 shillings per week for the term. One pound for board, and the International Student Service would pay that, and a grant of 12 pounds was made from the payment funds, four pounds for Ridley Hall, four pounds for out-of-pocket expenses, and four pounds for emergencies. And most significantly, the Professor Buckland was to be approached to secure the right introduction to the university library. In January 1939, the future of Dr. Ullman was considered further, and his probable continuing financial need noted. And in June 1939, Robin Lappin of Queen's College, a medieval as well as contemporary historian of Southeastern Europe, who appears to have supplemented the Cambridge funds from his own pocket on a number of occasions, and not just for Ullman, reported the possibility of Ullman getting a teaching position at a school. For if this proved unsuccessful, another application was to be made to the International Student Service to enable him to have a further year in Cambridge to take his PhD. <clears throat> On the 24th of July 1939, Dr. Lappin announced that Ullman had secured a post as master at Ratcliffe College in Leicestershire for one year. The minute book of the case committee is full of reports of attempts to find lodgings and secure paid employment for the refugees, even if only as domestics and college porters, in order to provide some means of support. Ullman seems to have been offered a chance to earn some money earning German. For Elizabeth Ullman records that only a week after he arrived in Cambridge, she met him when she was an undergraduate at Girton reading English for German tuition at the house of a blind scholar, also a historian. And this can only have been Cabled Lee of 47 Alstone Road in Newnham and a member of the Cambridge Refugees Case Committee. Despite this year of, I quote, desolation, hardship, misery, poverty and hopelessness, Ullman's words, the friendship between Ullman and this English undergraduate Elizabeth Knapp flourished and they were married in November 1940. But this is to anticipate the events of 1939 and 1940, for which the SPSL archive offers further clues relating to Ullman's internment in 1940 after one year teaching at Ratcliffe. Lappin's letter was provided as part of the attempt to secure Ullman's release from the internment camp on the Isle of Man. And it stated that Ullman was a devout and practicing Catholic and his whole mentality is Austrian, Catholic and anti-Nazi. And stressed his scholarly achievements so far, with three articles <coughs> accepted and another already published. The master of Ratcliffe College also wrote saying that Ullman had taught Latin, <coughs> German geography and mathematics, mostly to middle school boys and that he was useful and hardworking. On the 4th of October, Lappin reported that Ullman had written to say he had been released from internment and was now in the Pioneer Corps. His army career was less than distinguished, and he was discharged on medical grounds in 1942. He later told the stories of how his duties, first on latrine fatigue and later doing office work, at least gave him time to get on with his work on the post glossators. <laughs> he used the typewriter in the commandant's office. In 1942, Ullman returned to Ratcliffe to continue teaching until he moved to the University of Leeds, until 1947. He was naturalised on the 1st of October 1947, writing to SPSL jubilantly that he was now Kiwis Britannicus, and had been invited to deliver the Maitland Memorial Lectures in Cambridge. It's time now, in the final part of this paper, it's the shortest part, to chart how the indigent refugee lawyer became respected in England for his scholarship on the Middle Ages. If we return to Ullman's years in Vienna, the testimonials from Rittler and Kadetska are revealing. It needs to be remembered that Ullman, if, if Ullman were intending to make a plausible case for academic work in England, quite apart from the need to get study leave, the testimonials may have been accordingly pointed. <coughs> Nevertheless, both men state that Ullman was undoubtedly scholarly and are strikingly insistent on his fervour and passion for academic work and the theory of law. Their wishes for his future success suggest, moreover, that both men were doing their best to help him leave the country safely and were in no doubt about the implications of his departure. 
Cadets, though, in particular, endorsed Ripper's very positive portrait and even more extravagant language, saying that Ullman belonged to that small group of students who he had especially encouraged in academic research, that he had a passionate thirst for knowledge and a fanatic interest, fanatische Interesse, in all dogmatic, psychological, historical and philosophical problems related to penal law, <clears throat> that he had given lectures on guilt, and that his participation in teaching the post prosaitos had given him the necessary competence to pursue independent scholarly research. His talents, enthusiasm, and character indicated that Ullman had a bright future before him. Ullman's discovery of the post prosaitos therefore, was a gradual process. It began in Vienna in 1935, or perhaps a little later, and he later recalled how he had struggled to read the 16th century editions of canon law and the post prosaitos with the aid of the standard guide to abbreviations by Capelli. Certainly, Ullman's anxiety to gain access to a good library once in Cambridge and the extensive consultation of 16th century editions of canon law evident in his footnotes and bibliographies suggest that he had a list of desiderata among the notes he brought with him from Vienna. In the Wren Library in Trinity and in Keyes, Ullman was also delighted to discover new works, not least the 1597 reprint of Lucas de Pena's treatise on the last three books of Justinian's Codex Juris Civilis, a work the Lucas de Pena um, hitherto unknown to him, and which suggested new avenues for him to explore. His Vienna research for the Habilitationsschrift laid the foundations that he subsequently built on in his first year in Cambridge, during school vacations in 1939 to 40, and once discharged from the army in 1942, again in the school vacations. Ullman's first article was a study of the Italian jurists, officially published in 1941, though received as an off-print, as you see from the picture on the right, in the Wren in 1939. These early articles are on various aspects of the interpretation and teaching of law by the medieval Italian post clausetas notably Bartolus, Sassoferrato, and Baldus de Ubaldis, both of the 14th century, and address the topics of customary law and the notion of the tacit consent of the people, the theory of law, torture, and the medieval theory of legal and illegal organizations, trade guilds, political factions, and charitable organizations. Quite apart from their testimony to the extraordinary rapidity with which Ullman had acquired a command of academic English, the articles have a strongly expository and didactic character, introducing the thinking and work of these early jurists into the discussion of law more generally. A strikingly common theme is Ullman's conviction of the importance of the rule of law and the moral responsibilities of the lawyer and judge in relation to the law, expressed through the medium of exposition of the ideas of a group of 14th century Italian jurists. There is an evangelical further in Ullman's advocacy of the importance of these jurists' work, as well as a nod in the direction of revising dismissive estimates of their importance hitherto by an older generation of German legal historians. Ullman insists in article after article that law was part of legal, social, and cultural history, and that Christian morals and philosophy underlay the law. The articles include comments about the function of jurists as upholders of law and order versus illegal political organizations. In his discussion of the influence of Roman law in relation to torture, his comment that jurors talked about torture as judges and that, quote, as professors, they never lost touch with practical problems, hints at a degree of sympathetic identification with the specific concerns of these medieval scholars on Ullman's part. He advocated the systematic study of the Italian jurists as indispensable to the adequate evaluation of legal ideas and the knowledge of the very idea of law itself. All this work culminated in Ullman's first book, published by Methuen in London, a study of Lucas de Pena's massive 1,000-page commentary on the last three books of Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis, 
Ullman used the Trinity copy printed in 1597 and thanked the Wren librarian Adam Scalsonley in his preface. Ullman stressed that the book contained a complete exposition of the fundamental legal principles and juristic rules relating to all departments and ramifications of law. He admired Lucas's ethical and moral interpretation of justice, his insistence on the ultimate authority of law, his stress on equality before the law, and the importance of the impartiality of the judge. Lucas himself was a practicing lawyer in Naples and not an academic. At the time Lucas wrote, it was a somewhat eccentric occupation to devote oneself to expounding the final three books of Justinian rather than concentrating on mainstream topics of law discussed and glossed by the law professors in Bologna and elsewhere in northern Italy. Nevertheless, Lucas de Pena enjoyed a considerable reputation and was published and reprinted a number of times in France in the 16th century in the context of the French Renaissance jurors interest in Roman law and their discussions of the French constitution. Ullman's preface to Lucas de Pena explained that the bulk of his material was gathered in the Wren. That material comprises primarily 16th century editions of the work of the post Garcetos. At this stage, Ullman did not seem to have thought to investigate whether there were any surviving manuscripts of either Pena's work or the work of other authors discussed in his book. One of these was Pinus, and the renowned Dutch historian of Roman law, Edvard Meyers, commented in his review of the book that it was a pity Ullman seemed unaware of the manuscript of Pinus's work just down the road from Trinity in Peterhouse, it's manuscript 34, but then conceded that it had been wartime. He was also critical <laughs> both of Ullman's ignorance of a number of recent work of modern legal scholarship on these medieval authors, and more seriously, two instances where Ullman had attributed to Lucas views exactly the opposite of those he had actually held by omitting part of Lucas de Pena's argument. Ullman had also quoted key phrases out of context. Nevertheless, Myers and many other distinguished historians at the time stressed their admirations of Ullman's overall scholarship, the clarity and forcefulness of his exposition, and praised the originality and interest of the chapter on crime and punishment. Thorne further commented that Ullman's book would seem less a treatise on the medieval idea of law than an exposition of and valuable guide to the ideas of a 14th century Italian jurist, but was nonetheless a valuable explorer, exploratory venture into the treacherous borderland between law and political theory. So let me conclude. It is conceivable that Ullman's career might have remained a balancing act between his work as criminal lawyer and his lecturing in law at the University of Vienna had he stayed. Had he completed his Habilitationsschrift, he would have qualified for a university professorship and his articles and books and their subjects might have been much the same. In a curious kind of way, he lost out in both countries. In Austria, he had not received anything but university training in law and classics at school. He had not received the Hilfswissenschaft training that was and remains a standard requirement for medievalists in Vienna. Although he may have taught some history of law in Vienna, he had no formal historical training, nor, apart from the few lectures by Alphonse Dopsch he had attended, did he have, did he have any dealings with the Institut für Österreichische Geschichtsforschung, which is so central a part of history in Vienna. He never seemed particularly interested in paleography or diplomatic, at least not in his earliest years, nor had he any sensitivity to the problems of transmission of texts or editions. He was also surprisingly dismissive of the scholarship of the medieval historians as distinct from the scholars of Roman law among his English colleagues, commenting with hindsight in 1977 that he was able to explain medieval legal sources which nobody in this country had yet studied in depth, though libraries had vast amounts in this field. I was able to become something of a bridge builder. Scholars in England had only a vague notion of the medieval jus commune and ecclesiastical law. It also became clear to me that medieval jurisprudence and the law had played a much larger part in the historical process than medievalists at the time were prepared to admit. Ullman plunged into the work of the themes that interested him, using his very considerable linguistic skills, 
to explicate medieval Latin commentaries on Roman and canon law. In England, he certainly had conversations with historians of English medieval law and of Roman law, and greatly respected Hazeltine, particularly for his synthesis on medieval law. But unlike many other scholars who came to Britain, he regarded it less as an opportunity to embrace, to embrace different approaches than as a force to exile, but nevertheless an opportunity to get his hands on the text he wanted in the libraries and to keep on working. In his own memoir, there is no indication of his finding or adopting new ways of thinking about his work as a consequence of being in Cambridge, apart from the books. Hardships and difficulties were simply obstacles to his work on the post crusaders and elements in the history of law. I am mindful of the very apt observation in the obituary and the proceedings of the British Academy that Ullmans was a templa natur, who fashioned for himself a uniquely personal vision of the European past. He worked on law and legal scholarship and the interaction of law and political thought. The British Academy also claimed that this interaction was in specific historical situations, but Walter rarely paid attention to specific as distinct from general ones. Generally, his vision was indeed of a society and set of political circumstances in which the texts he expounded played a role. But his interest was always more on the theoretical than the practical side, whatever his protestations to the contrary. On the other hand, Ullman's zeal and conviction of the importance of the history of law, of perceptions of crime and criminal behaviour, and of power relations in legal terms, was surely affected by the disruption of legal procedure and abuse of the judicial system he had seen beginning in Austria. His experiences might then be thought to be what shaped his intellect and precipitated him towards the investigation of eccentric scholars and slightly offbeat medieval jurists like Lucas de Pena, because they too had a passion for the law. The conclusion of Ullman's book is unexpectedly revealing in this respect, for he says the following of Lucas. I quote, The great value of this jurist's work lies in the method by which he elaborated and clarified ancient, not to say outworn, traditional ideas. He was a distinguished, though lonely scholar, an independent thinker, a fearless writer, a seeker after truth and justice, a true Christian. Ullman's early career and writings reflect a curious degree of emulation of this 14th century scholar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent and very interesting uh, paper.